Brachos daf lamed dalid is the last daf in the parak. It has two mishnayos, and it takes us to the end. So the first mishnah discusses mistakes that a person might make during shemana esrei. It discusses the manner in which shemana esrei is ordered, how it's divided up, and it also discusses the proper place that one should bow in shemana esrei, who should bow, and what the different types of bowing are. The next mishnah talks about smoothness of tefillah, that one should find his tefillah to be easy, and what it means if it's not easy. The Gemara there takes a couple of side steps and talks about the reward that Sadiqim will have in the future, and the healing powers of the prayers of Rabbi Hanina ben Daisa. The Daf opens with a Mishnah, which teaches us six halachas pertaining to a chazan who makes a mistake, or might be in a confusing situation that will lead him to make mistakes during his Shemana Esrei. So first, the Mishnah says that if somebody says, Yevarechecha toivim Hashem, the good people should praise you, that's a terrible thing to say, and it is considered to be heresy, apikarsis, because we include both Tzadikim and Rishayim in our Minyanim. Then we get to these halachos. The Mishnah says, if the chazin makes a mistake, and Rashi explains that means that he skips a bracha, and then he can't figure out which bracha he's supposed to go back to and where he's up to. So we remove him, we put somebody else up instead. The Gemara says, generally the halacha is that if you're asking you to be a shliach tzibur, to be a chazin, you should refuse once or twice. Um, but in this case, because it's in the middle of Shemana Esrei, you don't want to create a delay, and you shouldn't refuse, you should agree right away. Then the Gemara says, where does the new chazin start from? He starts from the bracha that the person skipped, the original, and then he continues straight from there. Next halacha, a kayan who is a chazin should not say berchas kayhanim unless he is very confident that he won't get confused and he'll be able to go back to being the chazin afterwards and there are no other kayhanim. Uh, the chazan himself should not answer Amin to the Kayan's bracha because he needs to say the words to lead the chazan on and he needs to conclude afterwards and therefore he should not say Amen to the bracha of the Kayan because we don't want him to get confused. Okay, now we get to the Gemara, which brings, first of all, uh, Brysa, which discusses the halacha about refusing to be the chazan. The Gemara says that when they ask you to be the chazan, you should initially refuse. And if you don't refuse, you just jump right in, then you're like a pot of soup that has no salt. And if you refuse too much, so then you're like a pot of soup that got burnt. How should you do it? What's the right way to approach it? So the Gemara says, the first time they ask you, you should refuse. The second time, you should begin moving around as if you're about to get up. And the third time, you should actually get up and go down to the Chazan Shish. So you should, you should refuse, demur, and then approach. Okay, the Gemara brings another Brisa. Similar idea. The Gemara says there are three things that too much is no good and too little is is good. It's better to have less than more. And these are the three things. Yeast, you don't want too much yeast in your dough. Salt, don't have too much salt in the food, and refusals. You don't have too many refusals. Okay, now the Gemara quotes a Machlikes about making mistakes in Tefillah. And the Gemara will try to prove one of the two sides from our Mishnah. The Gemara has Machlikes as follows. Rav Huna says that Shemun is divided up into three sections. There's the first three brachos, there's the last three brachos, and there's everything in between. Each is an individual section, and if somebody makes a mistake in one of the sections, he has to go back to the beginning of that section, such that. If he makes a mistake in the middle of Shemun he has to go back to the beginning of the middle section, which is Chayin Hadas. Rav Asi says, There is no significant order to the brachos in the middle, and you can say them in any order you like. The order is not important. Now, that definitely doesn't fit with our Mishnah, which says that if somebody said the brachos out of order, you remove him. But what about Rav Huna? Does it fit with Rav Huna? So Rav Shesha says, well, if you look in our Mishnah, it says that he should go back to the beginning of the bracha, the one that was skipped. It seems to imply you don't go back to the beginning of the section. So that is not like Rav Huna, who says you go back to the beginning of the section. Where it says Rav Huna will answer, no, when it says beginning of the bracha, it means the beginning of the section. The whole section is considered to be like one bracha. The Gemara now quotes a statement of Rav Yehuda, which also agrees with these this division of the three sections. He says a person should not request things from a Kaddish Baruch Hu in the first three brachas or the last three brachas of Shema Nasser because they are ordered as follows. The first three is like a servant who is praising his master, he's approaching and he's praising, it's part of his approach. The middle section is the servant who is requesting something from his master, and the final section is Haida, is thank yous, is the servant who is uh, showing gratitude for what he has received and taking his leave. Okay, now the Gemara brings two stories with Revelozar and a 
chazan who took a strange amount of time. The first incident is that there was a chazan in front of Rabbi Eliezer who was taking too long, and the Talmudim said, Rabbi, look how long he's taking. And he said, no, what's the big deal? He's not taking longer than Amayish Rabbeinu, who was misbelled for 40 days and 40 nights. That was a different incident, where there was somebody taking too short. He was zooming through it. And they said to Rabbi Eliezer, look how quick he's going. And he said, it's not quicker than Amayish Rabbeinu, who said, Kel na rifa na lo. When he was praying for Rufa Shalema for Miriam, his sister, he just said five words. Where says, Rabbi Yaakov, it says in the name of Rav Chizda, if you're praying for somebody to have a recovery, you do not have to mention the name, because you see, in that tefillah, Moshe did not mention Miriam's name, he just referred to her as La. Uh, the Rishonim here add that's only if you're in front of the person. If your person's not there, then you should mention the name. Okay, now the Gemara launches into a discussion of which part of Shema a person should be bowing. The Gemara will discuss that there are different types of people should do different types of bowing. The more high up you are in the social order, the more you need to humble yourself and the more you should bow. And then tomorrow we'll talk about different types of bowing and what they are. So first thing tomorrow says, a regular person should bow twice in the bracha of Avos, once at the beginning, once at the end. That's when we start Shemon Esrei, and when we say the bracha of Magen Avram, which is the end of the bracha of Avos. Then it says the person should also bow in the beginning of Maidim and at the end of Maidim. We bow by the word Maidim and by the end of the bracha Kalahi Da Ois. And the Gemara says... A regular person who would like to bow at every bracha, beginning and end, he should not. It's not the correct thing to do. However, the Gemara says a Kain Gadol should bow at the end of every bracha. And a king should bow at the beginning of every bracha and at the end of every bracha. Yitzhak Baruch says you should say even more than that. Uh, this is for a regular person. Kain Gadol, the beginning of every bracha, and the king should bow once, and he should stay in the bowed position for the entire rest of the field. Like it says about Shlom HaMelech, when Shem finished davening, that's when he got up. Before then, he was kneeling on his knees the entire time. Okay, now the Gemara quotes a Brisa, which explains what the different types of bowing are. So we have Kida, we have Hishtach and we have Kriya. So Kida, the Gemara says, is if he brings his face to the floor, the Mepharshim have a machlok, if that's from a standing position all the way to the floor, a very difficult thing to do, or from a seated position, also not simple. Either way, he only supports himself off the ground with his thumbs and brings his face all the way to the floor. That's called Kida, like it says by Vatikad Basheva Apayim Eretz. She brought her face to the floor. Kriya, what's that? Kriya is on the knees, kneeling. Yishtachava is lying flat on the floor, prostrating oneself with arms outstretched, arms and legs outstretched, like it says, flattening ourselves on the floor. Now, the Gemara says there is a part of Tefillah called Nefilas Apayim, that's right after Shemayin Esri. We say Tachnun as Nefilas Apayim. It is special prayers requests from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. And Nefilas Apayim involves a bowing of some sort. So we only put our heads on our arms, but in the earlier days they would do a complete prostration. The Gemara says that Abaya and Rava did not do a complete prostration. They they lean slightly on their sides instead of doing a full prostration. Now the Gemara discusses the bowing at Hida, the section of which involves thanking Hashem, that's Moedim. We said before that one might be supposed to bow at the beginning and at the end of the bracha. The Gemara notes um, a, contradiction, a contradiction as to whether one should do this or not. And the Gemara tries a couple different ways of resolving. So the Gemara says, I have two braces. One says you're supposed to bow at Moedim, and one says you're not supposed to. So how do you resolve the two? So one says you are supposed to bow, and one says it's disgusting if you bow. It's meguna, it's revolting. So the Gemara first wants to say that you're supposed to bow in the beginning and not at the end. So the Gemara says that can't be the answer. Rava used to bow both the beginning and the end. And they asked him, why do you do this? And he said, because Rav Nacham did it and Rav Sheshis did it. So that can't not be the answer to the contradiction. So the Gemara says, okay, you're right. You're supposed to bow both the beginning and the end. The place where you're not supposed to bow by Hoida. By the thank you is in Halal, when it says, Haidu Lashem Kitev Kilayim Chazda, you're not supposed to bow there. The Gemara says, okay, but there's another Brysa. The Brysa says that one who bows by Haida and Haida of Halal, both are Magunas. You see, it's not just Halal, also Shman Esrei. So you didn't answer the question. The Gemara says, no, 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 no. There's a third Maidim. That Brysa is talking about two Maidims that you're not supposed to bow. That's talking about the Maidim in 
Hallel, Hallel Hashem Kitov, and the Maidemin Berchas Hamazon, the Bracha of Neidelacha. But Shemad Esra, you are supposed to bow. And that takes us to the new Mishnah. Says the Mishnah, somebody who is in the middle of Shemad Esra and he makes a mistake, he finds that he's tripping over his words, is a bad sign for him. And if he's the Shliach Tzibur, if he's the Chazan, it's a bad sign for the entire congregation. The Mishnah relates an incident. Rabbi Chanina ben Daisa, often, he used to finish his tefillah for sick people, and he would say, well, this one's going to live and this one's going to die. And they asked him, how do you know? And he said, simple, I have a Kabbalah that whenever my tefillah goes smoothly, that person is going to live because my tefillah is accepted. And whenever I find myself having trouble, then that tefillah has been rejected. The Gemara begins by asking, on which part of Shemana does this apply? That you have to be smooth, otherwise it's a bad sign. Some more quotes are of Safra in the name of Chad Debei Rebi. Who says that it's in Avais, the first three, the first bracha? So the Gemara is not sure if that is what he said about the first bracha or if it was a different thing. The Gemara has a possibility that this statement was said on the halacha that a person must concentrate on the words, otherwise it's not yaitza, and that it was Rav Safa, the name of Bey Rebbe, who said that that's only in the first bracha. The Gemara now refers to the statement of Rabbi Hanina ben Daisi in the Mishnah that he knows if his tefillah goes smoothly that that will be Yeshua for the person he was being misspelled for. The Gemara says, how did he know that? The Gemara says he learned it out of the Pesach. He created the sweetness of the lips. Shalom, shalom, narachik v'lakarev. That will be peace to the one who is distant and the one who is close. Now the Gemara launches into a bit of a sidestep here, talking about the reward for Tzadikim in Olam Haba, and the Gemara will wind back around to the Pasuk of Shalom Shalom Larachik Velakarev, which also refers to the ultimate reward in the future for Tzadikim. So the Gemara says, as follows, says Rav, Chibar Abba Amar of Yechanan, all the prophecies that the Nevi'im said about the wonderful reward that awaits us was only said for somebody who is involved with Tamil Chacham. He marries his daughter to a Tamil Chacham. He does business to support a Tamil Chacham. He gives things to a Tamil Chacham to support him. And he, that he should be able to learn what the Midi Chachamim themselves, on that no Navi ever said anything because there's nothing a Navi could say about that. No I has been shown what that is like. Rechia Baraba said the name of Yechanan again. All the Navim, everything that they said about reward for the future is only talking about the days of Mashiach. Ba'ilam Haba, the next world, that's a totally different thing, and no I has been shown what that would be like. The Lord says that's different than Shmuel. Shmuel said, Yemez and Mashiach is the same as our days. The only difference will be that we won't be under the thumb of the foreign governments. And the Pasuk that proves that is, it says, Kilo yachdal evyon mikarev arts. The poor will not be removed from the land. Abchiyah Barabba and Abraham Rehachan says further, All the Nevi'im only said prophecies about the reward for Bali Tshuva. But the reward for Tzadik and Gemurim, people who never did Tshuva because they never sinned, Ah, no eye has been shown that reward. The Gemara says that's different than Rabbi Avo, who said that Bali Tshuva have a greater reward than Tzadik and Gemurim. Where Bali Tshuva stands, Tzadik and Gemurim cannot stand. Now the Gemara comes says, well, let's look at the Pasuk, Shalom Shalom the Rachik Karev. That lists the Rachik, the far one, before the Karev. That seems to indicate that the far one, somebody who was far and drew near, a Baal Tshuva, has a greater reward, he's mentioned first, than the Karev, who is near. So the Gemara says, well, not so fast. Rabbi Yechanan will say, what does far mean? Far means far from Avera. He's first, he's far from Avera. He was always a Tzaddik. Close means close to Avera, who then departed it. Now, the Gemara says, what is this Ayin Rasa? The eye has never seen. What does that refer to? So the Gemara quotes Rabbi Shul ben Levi, who says that it refers to wine that is locked in its grapes since the six days of creation. It's obviously not meant to be understood literally. Gan Eden is not a bunch of wine. And the Gemara has another explanation of it. It is referring to the. It's referring to Aden. Aden. No living creature has ever set eyes on Aden. The Gemara says, "What do you mean? Adam Rishon did." The Gemara says, "No, Adam Rishon was in the Gan." Gan and Aden are not the thing are not the same things. It says that a river departed from Aden to water the Gan. That means that they're different things. The Gemara now quotes two stories in Brysis about the amazing curing power of Rabbi Hanina ben Daisus Tfilas. The Gemara says that the son of Rabbi Gamliel got sick and he sent two messengers to go to to go to Rabbi Hanina ben Daisa to ask him to pray for the healing and recovery of his son. So he saw them coming, and he understood right away what this was about. He climbed up to his attic, and he went to be Mispalo. 
at some point he came down and he said, go back, it's okay, he has uh, recovered, he's on his way to recovery, his fever has broken. So I said to him, how do you know, are you a Navi, you're a prophet? He said, I'm not a prophet, my father wasn't a prophet, but I know that as long as my prayers go smoothly, they will be accepted. If my prayers don't go smoothly, they'll be rejected. So the two messengers wrote down the exact moment that he said that the fever had broken, and they came back to Rabban Gamliel, and they compared notes. Indeed, the sun had recovered, and his fever had broken. And he checked the time, and he said, it was, it's not off by a second. It's not a second earlier. It's not a second later. Precisely the time that you said, he said that. That's precisely the time that his fever broke, and he asked us for water. And the Bryce quotes another incident, that Rabbi Chanina ben Daisa went to learn to hear by Rabbi Yechonah ben Zakkai, and the son of Rabbi Yechonah ben Zakkai got sick. So he said, Chanina, my son, please pray for my son. So Rabbi Chanina ben Daisa put his head between his knees, and he prayed for the Rufu Shalema. he prayed for mercy from the Kaddish Baruch Hu. And he recovered. So Rabbi Yechonah ben Zakkai said to his wife, you know, if ben Zakkai would stick his head between his knees, or referring to himself, if I would stick my head between my n- knees all day, they would not Listen to me. So his wife said, what, you mean Hanina is greater than you? He said, no, it's not that he's greater than me. He is in the palace of the king like a servant before the king. That's how he is, is upstairs. And therefore, he has access. He can go wherever he wants. The servant is allowed to roam all over the palace. But I am like a officer of the king, and I can only request certain things if it's my time to request things. Okay, now the Gemara quotes to Allah. So Rabbi Yechiel Rabbi says, name every Rabbi and again, a person should not daven in a room that does not have windows. Just make sure you have windows. Rashi explains by seeing the sky, it brings you to greater humility. We learn it out of Daniel, who we had in a Pesach quoted earlier. In this parak, he had windows in his room where he went to daven, and the windows faced Yerushalayim. If Kahana said, somebody who goes to daven in the fields, in the valleys, to me, that's chutzpah. That's chutzpah. He's out there in the fields. He's very broad-minded. He should be in a closed room. He should be in a room where he will feel humbled. And if Kahana said, I think it's a chutzpah, somebody who enlists his sins. The Pasuk says, Asher Nisoy Pesha, Kizir Chata. You're not supposed to talk about your Averis. should be something that you are ashamed of, not proud of. This brings us to the end of the Perik and also the end of the Daf. And also to the end of the discussion about Tefillah. The next parak talks about Barachas, and that'll be the topic which will take us for quite a while.